Welcome. Well, good morning, everybody. Well, that was fun. Good morning. Everybody's up now. So we are glad that you are here. It's good to be in worship together. On this uh, Sunday of Advent, as we continue to uh, move towards uh, Christmas, as a church family, we are glad that you are with us. It's good to be together. We want you to know that you are welcome uh, in this space, that you are welcome to use this space and this time, uh, how your heart needs to use it this morning. Uh, you are welcome to uh, just rest if that's what you need. Uh, you are welcome to sing with us and stand if that's what you need. Uh, if, if whatever your heart and soul needs this morning, we want you to know that you are welcome to do that in this space. Whew. It was stressful. Uh, so, if you play professional music long enough, uh, you're going to make a Christmas album. It's just, it's, it has to happen. I have one. <laughs> I do. Now, and in my opinion... In the top three Christmas cover albums of all time. It's the best one. Was a hair metal Christmas. Uh, made from the glam bands of the 80s. Including uh, Oh Come All Ye Faithful by Twisted Sister. Come ye to Bethlehem. 
sing choirs of angels sing in exaltation sing all ye cinders and of heaven above oh come all ye faithful joyful and triumphant oh come ye oh come ye to bed yea lord we greet Born this happy morning, Jesus, to thee be our glory. Word of the Father, now in flesh appear. Oh, come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Welcome to this holy sanctuary and to worship here at Wilkes Boulevard United Methodist Church. Please join me in our welcome. You'll see it on the screen. Whatever your race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, or economic situation, welcome here. Whatever your age or ability, background or belief. Whatever your relationship status or family structure, are welcome here. No matter who you are or what you've done, I welcome you in the name of Christ. Please stay where you are, but ac take just a moment to acknowledge your neighbor, the people that are around you. Good morning, everybody. And please stand for our opening praise hymn. You'll find it in the Red Book, number 474, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Sorry, my book fell off my piano. Whew, we're having a day, aren't we? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am gone. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Drear, precious. 
Jesus, Lord, and linger near when my life is almost gone. Hear my cry. Lest I fall, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the rain. You'll find our second hymn in the red book, number 196, Come the Long Expected Jesus. Please be seated and join in our prayer hymn, Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's in the red book, number 211, if you're looking at that. Verses uh, 1, 3, 5, and 7. 5 and 7 are on the opposite page. on size height in ancient times once gave the law in cloud and majesty
Thou brought us forth to life. Deliver us from earthly strife. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I want you to know that uh, Turning Point will open at 12.30 this afternoon and remain open until 4.30 this evening. And we'll ask for that half an hour transition time uh, after church and before loaves and fishes. Uh, but there is uh, Turning Point hours uh, uh, will commence at 12.30 uh, this afternoon. Uh, you all have the same access to weather apps that I do. Uh, our overnight emergency shelter here is set at 25 degrees or below for the overcast for the overnight forecast. Uh, the Health and Human Services Department makes that call. Turning Point does not make that call. Uh, they call us and tell us that we're going to be open tonight. Uh, so uh, if I had my druthers, you'd all be at room at the inn this evening. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to open our, our warming center until Friday and Saturday night this week. Uh, it's looking uh, above 25 degrees before that. Uh, but on Sunday afternoons, uh, to kind of uh, to deal with the bus schedule uh, and uh, to our friends at the library and our friends at the Ark, uh, Turning Point is going to open uh, this afternoon. Uh, so uh, after church, we can all hang out outside until 1230 and uh, Turning Point will let, let us upstairs. Um, I think that's what's going on in our, in our community. Um, I'll just put it in your ear uh, that we're not going to do anything on Christmas Day. Uh, Wilkes Boulevard United Methodist Church will not be open on Christmas Day. Uh, once every eight years, Christmas Day falls on a Sunday morning. Uh, and uh, this year, uh, we voted and we decided that we're not going to do anything. Uh, and uh, we've been blessed for the past eight years uh, that room at the inn stays open all day long on Christmas Day. Uh, so if you're staying at room at the inn, there's, there's no reason to leave. There'll, there'll be uh, cookies and, and things delivered throughout the day on Christmas Day. Uh, there's also a community meal at St. Luke's United Methodist Church right across Providence here from us uh, at noon on Christmas Day. Uh, but I just want to put it in the back of your minds for the next two weeks uh, that, that Wilkes will not open uh, on Christmas Day until loaves and fishes uh, serves dinner. And we take all of this in, in thanksgiving and, uh, and gratitude, and we take all of this with the prayers of, of our staff and volunteers and all of us staying together. Uh, it is hard for people who have absolutely everything in this world to spend as much time together as you all spend together in at Room at the Inn and in Turning Point and in Loaves and Fishes. You have absolutely everything to, in this world. That's a lot of time to spend together uh, with the same people. <laughs> Whether you love them dearly with all of your heart or not, sometimes it can just be a little bit much. So we're going to take our winter, <laughs> we're going to take all of this stuff, and we're going to uh, take it to God in an attitude of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for this day. 
and for bringing each and every one of us here to this time that we share together in worship. We thank you for this particular community of people that is gathered like this right here and right now for the only time it will ever gather like this. And we rest in that, that the, the, the uniqueness and, and specialness uh, of the, this moment that we share together. We come together from several, many, varied walks of life and we, we thank you for offering us, for bringing us into this community where we all can walk together and learn from each other from different experiences in this world. We give you thanks for the ministries of this church, the ministries we house and host. We pray for the staff of Turning Point Day Center and our volunteers of Loaves and Fishes Soup Kitchen. We pray for all those that use these services and and walk through these doors. We give you thanks for our friends at Room at the Inn and their volunteer corps. And we pray for, for safety. We pray for the provision. Uh, we pray for resources. We pray for, uh, for full staff calendars uh, for all of our friends along this network throughout this winter. We come together at this time in this community to prepare our hearts for what Jesus' arrival means to this world. And we pray this morning that you give us the wisdom and the courage to make room for that in our own hearts, in our own spirits. For us to make room for preparation for what this actually means for our lives, for our communities, for our world, what Jesus' arrival can do. We know that we have made mistakes and we have stumbled and we have failed and we pray forgiveness. We pray for your spirit to be fresh among us and in us as we continue to build a community together that is messy and loud and chaotic and beautiful. It is as that community that we join our voices together with our hearts and spirits as we pray the Lord's Prayer, together as you taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture is from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, 
which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. We're going to turn our attention this morning to Christmas proper. Don't tell my grandfather. I mean, you can't tell my grandfather, but don't tell my grandfather that I'm going out of order and I'm bringing Christmas up, even though it's Advent. But we're not having church on Christmas, right? Uh, so we're going to go uh, to the gospel accounts of the birth of Jesus. And I love this time, and I love this stretch of sermons. This might be my favorite stretch of sermons uh, of the Christian year, the, the two weeks before Christmas and a Christmas Eve sermon because I get to really dig into the Christmas story with all of you, tell you what you have wrong about it, ruin it for you just a little bit, and then hopefully bring it back with more meaning uh, than it had before, I hope. Uh, so, for instance, let's get started. Let's talk about Santa Claus. Uh, the only way to tell if your Santa Claus is the real Santa Claus is when you're going to visit Santa Claus, ask him where he stands on the substance of Christ. What is Christ made of? Homoousius or homoousius? And if he doesn't know what you're talking about, that's not the real Santa Claus. Okay? St. Nicholas was, a, was the real deal. St. Nicholas was a bishop of uh, the Roman church of, of Greek descent. He lived between uh, 250 and 350 uh, CE. He, didn't, he wasn't 100 years old, but that's, those are the dates that we have. Uh, and we don't know much about him. Nothing he wrote uh, survived. Uh, nothing uh, written about him survived other than his attendance at the Council of Nicaea. It was a big church meeting in the early church that happened in 325 uh, C.E., Common Era, where they decided, among other things, once and for all, that Christ and God were made out of the same stuff. That Christ and God shared a substance. Yes, they had a committee meeting about this. They discussed the pros and cons of Christ sharing a substance with God and God sharing a substance with Christ, and it was voted that homoousius would win the day. They were of the same substance. You know, Christmas stuff. The real Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, would know exactly what you're talking about when you bring up homoousius. And if they don't, not the real Santa Claus. So somewhere along the line, St. Ni Nicholas, well, Bishop Nicholas, became... Saint Nicholas, and among many other things, he became the patron saint of children. When you get sainted in the Roman Catholic Church, you, you, have, you become a patron of uh, travelers, patron of mothers, patron of, and Saint Nicholas became the patron saint of children, among a lot of other things. Sound, man. So the legend of St. Nicholas grew and grew and grew, uh, and people started telling stories, especially about St. Nicholas's unwavering generosity. And they started telling this story that in his parish, uh, St. Nicholas would go around and anonymously leave gifts for the children. And the legend of St. Nicholas made it all the way across Europe, and it eventually made it to the Netherlands, where they started saying Sinterklaas instead of St. Nicholas, and Santa Claus was born. Everything else about the Santa Claus story is added later, throughout the years. There's no the North Pole, Mrs. Claus, the elves working in the toy shop, reindeer, all that stuff is added 
as the story goes on. There was no Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer until Montgomery Ward needed a commercial in 1939. You remember Montgomery Ward, anybody? So they needed a commercial. And Rudolph was their Christmas spokesperson, created by admin in 1939. This is how stories form. It's a very natural thing. I'm sure it doesn't feel like that at the time, but looking back historically, it seems like an easy thing. Like things, these things just happen. But I bet the meeting was like, all right, so the, is, is it a reindeer? Does it have a light up tail? Does it have a light up ears? Do we go with uh, snow leopard? Like what? And they tossed it around and then they landed on red nosed reindeer. But our stories become customs and our customs inform our stories and it goes round and round and round. And the same thing has happened to our Christmas story. I like to joke that this is one of my favorite times of year because I get to ruin Christmas. But that's not really it. I, Christmas is important enough to me that I want to get what the Bible says about Christmas right in my head. I love this stretch of sermons because we get to talk about that and then hopefully add a whole nother layer to the story. See, our Christmas story has been added to and adapted and edited by culture and customs and traditions over the years. And yes, admin, yes, TV writers. It's not good or bad. It's, just, it's perfectly natural. It's perfectly neutral. It's what happens to stories. But I think it's important for us to cut through all of the additions and changes and omissions. So a little Bible study first. Uh, the birth of Jesus Christ does not make it into all four Gospels in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark, the earliest written Gospel, doesn't include a birth story. John, the last, uh, the latest written Gospel uh, account, does not include a birth story. John is much more concerned with the poetic uh, delivery of theological concepts than telling a narrative story. Only Matthew and Luke include the birth of Jesus Christ in their accounts, and their accounts are very, very different. We have this nice setup, by the way. Uh, this is from the Bryans to Wilkes Boulevard United Methodist Church um, this, this year. Um, it's also completely wrong, right? So, <laughs> we have, this, is, this is Matthew's uh, this is Luke's side over here with the shepherds. Luke included the shepherds. Matthew does not. Also, the three wise men were not present at the birth of Jesus Christ. It says uh, the next chapter after we just read that the wise men from the east come in the time of, in the time of Herod after Jesus was born in Bethlehem and had moved to Nazareth. We're talking, he's a toddler, right? So only Matthew and Luke include birth stories, and they're very different. Whoever wrote the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, we know as Matthew and Luke, but they weren't there that day, right? We know that. This isn't, this isn't reporting. This is storytelling. Now, I, I happen to believe that storytelling is just as important as reporting. And I want, I want you to hear that. This is not writing down what you see because Matthew, the apostle, was present at the birth of Jesus Christ. That, that didn't happen. Matthew was written about 70 years later. But I think storytelling is just as important as reporting the events as they happened. So what's not in Matthew? No shepherds? I had I thought in my head that I created a slide, and I didn't. There's no shepherds in Matthew. There's no manger in Matthew. There's no inn in Matthew. There's no angel's visit to Mary in Matthew. There's no Mary's visit to Elizabeth uh, in Matthew. That's all in the Gospel of Luke. Matthew is a story about this nuclear famine. 
Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And our main character is Joseph. Joseph, the stepdad of God. I wonder if I wonder if Jesus ever got to use you're not my real dad to Joseph. <laughs> right? I feel like that would be my go-to if I was getting in trouble as Jesus Christ. But Joseph is our focus here. We don't know why. Luke focuses on, on Mary. Matthew focuses on Joseph. Mary and Joseph discover that Mary is pregnant after their betrothal, but before their wedding. Their families would have, for all intents and, and purposes, signed on the dotted line that this, that this union was acceptable to both families. They would have exchanged goods uh, in, that, in the name of that engagement. They would have said Mary's parents had, you know, Joseph's parents probably had carpentry and wood and, and furniture available, and Mary's family had livestock uh, to, to give to, to Joseph's family. That, all that would have been worked out. But they had not done the ceremony yet. And the letter of the law calls for a woman discovered in adultery to be stoned to death. It's what the Jewish law says. And there's not, <laughs> there's not much evidence clearer than a pregnancy. Mary was, Mary was discovered. Now, we have this... Ri- the Bible, the Gospels are so awesome. So, later, in another Gospel, we remember, Jesus, uh, the adult Jesus, stops the public execution of a woman caught in adultery. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone, right? But Mary is caught. Mary and Joseph have not been together yet, and Mary is pregnant. And Joseph breaks the law for Mary, or he intends to. He decides that because he is a good man, a just man, other versions say righteous man, he plans to end the engagement quickly and quiet, quietly. Joseph intends to break the law of Moses for Mary's to not let her endure the social shaming and violent punishment of the religion. It literally says that that Joseph was going to send her away, probably back to her family. And and her son, who then would presumably not be Jesus, but then, then she and her son would live in her father's household for the rest of their days. Joseph was planning to secretly and illegally transport Mary somewhere safe for the sake of her reproductive autonomy instead of subjecting her to the social stigma and religious corporal punishment. Hmm. But Joseph's plan is interrupted by God, as, as is usually the case, right? We're rolling along and everything is lined up and we've made our decisions and God says, no, 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 we're going to do this instead. No, Joseph, marry the girl. This is the Spirit's child and he is holy. Holy literally means set apart. And you'll call him Josh. See, you see how stuff changes over time, right? We get from Yeshua in Hebrew, which is translated Joshua still today, and over the years, we get Jesus, right? I have That's the slide I made. So Jesus is, in Greek and ancient Hebrew, Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. We, you can see the Yahweh root in there with the Y and the H. The Lord is salvation. The Lord, the Lord saves. So Jesus' real name is Josh. And I've not met a Josh that I think lives up to the name of Jesus in my opinion. But it's just it, this is just funny how things work over time. We got from Joshua, the prophet of the Old Testament. Joshua. His, his name is written in our scriptures, Yeshua, and so is Jesus's. But over time we get to Josh. Yeshua became 
be- became Yezu, right? And Yezu became Jezu over time, and Jezu became Jesus. But the name is important because in both Hebrew and Greek, it means the Lord saves, the Lord rescues, the Lord delivers. Now, I feel like there's a lot missing <laughs> between the message from the angel and Joseph wakes up and does everything the angel says. There's a, there's a scene missing there, right? I mean, it's just like, well, all right. I mean, whatever you say, dream angel, I guess I'll raise this holy child that was born of the Holy Spirit. That's not mine. I mean, there's something missing here. When I found out I was going to be a dad, I spent several nights on the patio just screaming to the heavens, how the hell am I supposed to do this, right? And Evie's great and all, but she's not the savior of the world. But this is all we get. Joseph woke up and did everything the angel had commanded him. Without the openness of Joseph, without Joseph's adaptability, without Joseph's integrity and and righteousness, we don't have a birth story in Matthew. We don't have a Christmas in Matthew. Joseph accepting his, his calling to be become the stepdad of a savior, to raise a child that was not his own, to stay connected to Mary and, and honor their engagement vows, trust what was happening in Mary's life between Mary and God, even though it was separate from him. To trust what was happening in Mary's life, even though it didn't revolve around him, And it made him a side character. This is some serious manning up, if you ask me. The angel said, look, Mary and the Holy Spirit are going to do this thing. He's going to save his people, and people are going to call him. God is with us. And you, Joseph, you're going to be the husband. And Joseph says, okay. We need to spend a lot more time with Joseph in our conversations about gender and gender roles and fatherhood and manhood and masculinity. This is the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Joseph and a dream about an angel, and then he was born and then he was named. That's it. That's the whole scene in the Gospel of Matthew. No manger, no shepherds, no inn, no wise men, not even really a birth. Like they, he was just born and they named him. So it just says they had a son. None of that stuff is in there. And certainly, there's no drummer present, right? Now, obviously, that's my favorite Christmas song out of all the Christmas songs. But there is nothing worse you can possibly bring into the household with a newborn child than a drum solo, right? Matthew doesn't give us any of that. So what's important to Matthew, the the, the authors of the Gospel of Matthew, is what Matthew does include. The obedience and righteousness of Joseph as a good Jewish man. And the fulfillment of Scripture. The virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Matthew is more concerned with the references to the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament than any of the other Gospel writers. Matthew, it it says, this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet more than any of the other Gospel writers. His audience was the Jewish people, and, and in that time, his audience was Jewish men. So he lifts up in this, this birth story of Jesus Christ, a good Jewish man, and the fulfillment of Scripture. And they know exactly what they're doing. They quote Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This section of Isaiah is talking about the Assyrian oppression of the Hebrew Bible. I've talked to you guys so much before about the, the, the most important thing in the Hebrew Bible is the Exodus. The second most important thing is this time of exile and this time of, of empire where the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Hittites and the Midianites, they're all... Uh, They're all changing hands, but all oppressing the Israelite people. This quote by the Gospel writers of Matthew brings up 
the, the history of the Assyrian oppression. And there's this clear tie between the Assyrian Empire then and the Roman Empire now. And Matthew is saying, this, this, is, this is the kid. This is that child that Isaiah spoke of. Emmanuel, God with us. So, in the Hebrew language uh, of Isaiah 7, chapter 14, it does say, a young woman shall conceive. Virgin comes later with the Greek translation out of the Hebrew, but I'm not going to get into all that. This was a pretty common storytelling technique in the, in for the time period. Caesars and, and Pharaohs, they all had miraculous birth stories attached to them. And so if your intention was to present your guy as an alternative to these other guys, you would include some sort of miraculous birth to your story. That's not imp as important to me as who the actual people were involved here. Joseph and Mary. Common people. Regular stock. Working class, good Jewish, salt of the earth people. Emmanuel. The people will call him God with us. This child, like Isaiah said, will serve as a living reminder of God's constant presence with us. That no matter who's in charge, no matter how much we get tossed around by empire and different people in charge of the top spot and calling the shots, no matter what situation of, of life we find ourselves in, this kid, Mary's son, will live as a sign that God is with us. And this initial, this initial promise developed in, in prayer and community and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and at that council of Nicaea where Santa Claus was present into our Christian understanding of incarnation. That Jesus wasn't merely a symbol of God's presence with us. Jesus was God with us. And it changed everything. I mean, the, ca the calendar changed. That's, pr that's a really oversimplification of how that happened. And we got the math a little bit wrong in the process. But, I mean, how we, how we f organized human history changed. Everything that happened up, up until the birth of Jesus Christ became before. And everything that happened since the birth of Jesus Christ became after and now. The, the arrival of Jesus changed everything. And for, for me, I'm saying that, that the miracle of Jesus' birth doesn't need all of this. It doesn't need a virgin birth. It doesn't need those things. It can. It can have it. If you need it, that's absolutely fine. The most important thing to me is that Jesus' birth was a birth. That, Je that it was Jesus was actually born. Literally, physically, really born a human being. The, the bedrock of my Christian faith, the bedrock of my understanding of what church is supposed to be, of what this community is supposed to be like, is that God became a human life and irrevocably linked the divine presence to humanity. I believe that everything that God is, everything that has ever been revealed to us about who God is and everything that has yet to be revealed to us about who God is became Jesus Christ of Nazareth and was born and lived a human life. I believe that God was born and had a stepdad and a mom and, and brothers and sisters and lived a human life. That Jesus of Nazareth is Emmanuel, God with us. That's what Christmas means. The 
forging of that connection, that, that relationship between this earthly life and the, the divine mystery. There is, and there is no way that that ruins Christmas for me. That makes, that makes Christmas so much deeper and bigger and more powerful and more meaningful. That brings Christmas to a whole to a whole no, whole new level. Amen. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you at home. Uh, we're going to say say goodbye to Facebook Live here in just a minute. We're glad that you are with us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to ask. Uh, a few of our uh, community members uh, this morning to grab uh, a, a, a brass plate down there by Diane uh, to collect our offerings this morning. And I want you all to know that what you put into this plate is, is a symbol of uh, your devotion, uh, your obedience, your usefulness to God. I know I use the O word a lot this year, this, this Sunday. We can talk about it later. Uh, angel tree gifts are on the tree uh, back uh, on your way out. Uh, so pick up a tag if you wish, uh, $20 to $25 uh, of a gift, and then back here or back to Diana uh, once you have purchased those things. Uh, so this is an act of worship. This is an act of praise uh, to be able to offer anything uh, over uh, to God in our offering and our tithes uh, this morning. And this morning... Uh, we have a, a very special guest, uh, pianist, on our uh, offertory. May the ushers come forward. Uh, it is tradition to uh, rise as we sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all uh, blessings flow as we offer our gifts to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all blessings Most gracious God, we give you thanks for this uh, time that we have shared together, learning and, and singing and praising and praying together in worship uh, this morning, and we pray that your presence uh, abide in us and with us as we uh, leave this place to be your people and to do your work uh, in this world, and we offer you these gifts in the hands and hearts and lives of all those uh, who offer these uh, tokens, uh, that we want to be of use uh, to your ministry of justice uh, and uh, compassion and mercy wherever they may end up. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now in some uh, language from uh, that, I, that, that old school Isaiah uh, uh, proclamation of the coming 
Messiah, we sing our closing hymn number 213, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, behold the King of glory waits, the King of kings is drawing near, the Savior of the world is here, ding wide the portal. Until our glorious goal is won, eternal praise, eternal fame, be offered, Savior, to thy name. And now may the love of God, revealed in Jesus Christ, be with you in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Sing after Jay. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may God's face to shine upon. And as we part ways, may you know God's grace. Keep you strong. To God be the glory forever and ever, forever and ever. Amen. To God be the glory.